right. Okay. And Art, uh, you have the floor. Okay. Thanks, Chaz. Well, good morning, everybody. And uh, this wonderful weather we're having is why we live in Rochester, I think. Uh, why we live in the Northeast. So uh, we got to enjoy it while it lasts. Um, I'm glad that everyone's here that can make it. If, if anyone can't hear, raise your hand and someone will try to help you out. Also, we are captioned, so look for that little CC uh, down in the work thing in the bottom uh, to turn the captions on and clean them. Um, the captioning is uh, underwritten by Caption Call, and it's done by AI Media. And that, our caption writer, Cindy Thompson, she does a great job, and uh, she's helping us out. Um, I just want to take a minute to say that uh, we're working now on planning for the fall and next spring, a year from now, sessions. Uh, we are hoping that they will be in person and on Zoom. Now, we've done a lot with Zoom this year, which has been a godsend, and we're out reaching out beyond what normally uh, we did because we can go far beyond where people can drive to a meeting. So when we start the in-person, we will also be having a hybrid type situation where we also have Zoom because we don't want to lose this. Um, we're also reaching into adult living residences. We're talking with the city branch libraries about reaching into them with Zoom. So uh, there's a lot of things going on that we're planning for our next year, which starts in July. So for the fall and then into uh, 2022. So if you hear anything about in-person sessions and you're coming in on Zoom, don't get nervous. We're still gonna have Zoom here. Uh, there's a new course that we're, is being offered. Joe Kozalski put it together. It's three sessions, one hour each. And uh, it just happens that it starts uh, this Thursday um, on uh, the 10 o'clock on June 3rd. And then the second session is June 7th and the third is June 10th. This course is hearing aids for beginning. It's for someone who either hasn't uh, ever bought a hearing aid or someone who just got hearing aids. And it's about what you can expect, uh, what are reasonable expectations, and what probably uh, you, you won't be successful because the technology hasn't gone that far. But it's a great course for what to look for and what to be careful of, particularly with a lot of new equipment coming on the market. Um, some things are very good and some things are, are not so good. So it's a good course. And if you know anybody that is thinking of hearing aids or just got hearing aids, let them know about it. If you go to our website, hearinglossrochester.org, the same place you registered for this, you can also register for that course there. Um, now, during the, um, during the session, if you have a question, and it's a burning question, you can raise your hand, and, uh, and the speaker will uh, handle that right away. Or you can put it into the chat, and uh, after the session is uh, uh, to concluded, uh, Sue Miller will handle the questions that are in the chat, and you can also just raise your hand during that time and ask the question if you want to. And since we're going to be planning for our program content in the coming year, uh, on June 15th, please fill out the evaluation forms at the end with any ideas you have, any comments about this session, but also anything else that you think of, what you like, what you don't like, what would be meaningful for you. Those are the kinds of things we're looking for. So with that, I'm going to um, uh, say, fill out the form at the bottom of the invitation uh, to Carol Bradshaw, and uh, she'll then put this all together for us. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Suzanne Johnston to introduce our speaker today. Thanks, Art. Can everyone hear me? Yes, okay, good. Um, welcome, welcome today. I, have, I actually have the honor of introducing our speaker. Her name is Tila Palmer. 
Um, I got to know her last year, I think it was, last summer. Um, <clears throat> she is um, a doctor of audiology. She graduated from uh, East Carolina University with that degree and has since worked at Rochester Hearing and Speech Center. She, um, her areas of expertise include pediatric and adult hearing evaluations, as well as central auditory processing evaluations. And I will let her talk to you a little bit about what that means um, in her presentation. She also specializes in newborn hearing screenings, um, pediatric, as well as adult hearing aid fittings and dispensing. Um, and she also works in early intervention, um, providing hearing aids and working with um, children with cochlear implants um, and other hearing devices. <clears throat> and she is going to be speaking to us today about auditory processing. The title of her presentation is What We Do With What We Hear, Hearing and Processing Sound and Speech. Um, so I want to thank Tila for being here to present to us today. I know I'm really interested to hear what she has to say and um, I will let her go ahead and start. Um, she is going to be taking questions uh, throughout the throughout the presentation. So if you have a question, if you could raise your hand um, and she can call on you. Um, and of course, there's always the option of entering a question in the chat box and Sue Miller will be um, managing those questions also at the end of the presentation today. Okay, thank you so much, Sheila. Thank you, thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm going to share my screen, so I don't know if I'll go away or not, but let's see. Share. Okay. Let's get to the beginning here. Okay. Does everyone still see me? Did or did I go away? Okay. All right. So this is um, a presentation. We're going to be talking about auditory processing disorders. Um, I'm kind of a combination of old school and new school. So it'll be interesting to see if anything sounds familiar to anyone. Um, maybe some things that are um, you've, ne you've known before, some things that are new. Um, so just a bit more about me, just because I always think that's fun. Um, I am not from the Northeast. I grew up and was born in Arizona. So a little bit on the hot side. Um, I got my undergraduate degree um, in Bachelor of Science for speech and hearing. Um, I have some research background, uh, primarily in tinnitus, um, which has always fascinated me. But at some point, I really started to enjoy working with children. And there's so many different things that can be going on with kids, whether it's hearing loss or language-based disorders. Um, that's really what led me into auditory processing, just because, you know, that can be sort of um, be put to the side or there can be other um, diagnoses that a child has that we kind of see that not be addressed as much as maybe it could be. Um, I love my cat. There she is. Her name is Kitty. In my spare time, I knit um, and I donate things to different charities like blankets and so forth. Um, and I love working at Rochester Hearing and Speech Center. Um, I was always attracted to all the community outreach that we do. Um, this is a picture of myself um, and Dr. Greg Horton at a Walk for Hearing event um, that was in October and was outside. So a little bit cold there. So for today, um, there's a couple different things that I want to hit on. I want to have a brief um, discussion about just how we hear in our hearing system. I know that somebody had already addressed that in a different presentation um, recently, but I just want to have a brief overview of that. I want to talk about the definition of a pro an auditory processing disorder, also known as a central auditory processing disorder. They're kind of interchangeable there. Um, so you might see it as APD or CAPD um, throughout this presentation. 
We're going to talk about more specifically what are the types of processes that we would be assessing during an evaluation and what that person might experience if they have those processing difficulties. We're going to look at some APD models. Um, so looking at different researchers perspectives on APD and what their test battery might include. And then we're going to look at some recommendations, management strategies, and more direct remediation. And even though I might refer to kids a lot, you can even see on my shirt, I got little pandas having a pool party. <laughs> I work with kids so often, but this also can apply to adults. Um, there certainly can be adults who maybe grew up with this their whole life. And, you know, at the time, someone might have said something like, oh, I think they're just a little slow, or maybe it's a cognitive issue. But then we find out later in life that it's actually an auditory processing difficulty. So things that we can still address even after adolescence. So looking at the hearing system, here is primarily our, it's our peripheral system. So thinking about the central auditory processing is really more related to our neural structures um, from the brainstem up, but this is on our periphery on the outside. So of course we have our ear and our ear canal, which makes up the outer ear. We've got our middle ear system here, which is made up of our eardrum that we need to move back and forth and three middle ear bones that also move back and forth to drive that signal into our inner ear. So this is really what's sensing the presence of sound in this cochlea. And then that sound is traveled up through the eighth nerve, the auditory nerve. So when somebody comes in for a test, whether it's a regular hearing test or an auditory processing test, um, I still wanna look to make sure that the peripheral system is working like it should, because if it's not, that may potentially be contributing to this processing issue. So I look in the ear with an otoscope. I'm hoping to see something like this, which is our eardrum. It's got a shine to it. Um, there's no discoloration like anything yellow or white. I can actually see this little bone protruding here. Um, that's the malleus. Um, so one of those eardrum uh, ear bones. I would not want to see something like in the um, downward right. That is a ball of wax, which I would expect to contribute to some hearing difficulty. So before we did any processing evaluation, I would want to make sure that that's all clear. Looking at the middle ear, so here's our eardrum again on the top right, and it has a large hole in it. So if sound is supposed to kind of bounce off of this and we see this back and forth motion, if we have a hole in the eardrum, the sound is actually going to go through the hole rather than causing that bouncing effect. So not only would I expect a hearing loss, but then that might affect, you know, everything further up, traveling up the system. So in someone's report, we would see a graph that looks like this bottom right. If we see a nice peak that's representing the up and down motion or the back and forth of the eardrum. If we were to see a flat line, that is not what we would hope to see. That could either indicate um, an occlusion of something. It could be a wax, it could be jelly beans, um, or that could indicate that there's a hole in the eardrum. Now we get to the inner ear. So that's really the part where we're listening to those tiny beeps and we get very tired and it's difficult and we raise our hand to those sounds. So that is testing the inner ear, finally. So on a report, we would see a graph that looks like this. This is the audiogram. These circles are the right ear. X's are the left ear. At the top of the graph, we go from low pitch to high pitch going to the right. At the top of the graph, we have soft sounds getting louder as we go down the graph. So this person here has a pretty significant hearing loss almost across the board. But if we look at the inner ear, it is interesting to note that 
it's sensitive to different tones depending on where you look. So at the base of the cochlea, we have very high pitch sounds, so 20,000 hertz. As we circle around it, it gets low, it gets um, lower in pitch. So 4,000, 3,000, 1,000 to 200 hertz. So with that peripheral system, knowing that that is structurally working like it should, our next step is to the brain stem. So we get there from the cochlea through the eighth nerve. And when we look at the system, there are ipsilateral and contralateral pathways. So we have different stops through the brain stem. Some neural fibers are on the same side. And then we see like this blue color here at the bottom where it's crossing over and continues up. Same thing from the right side. So we have same side and contralateral side. So looking at this a bit more simply, we would want to make sure that throughout these stops, a signal is going through like it should. So there are tests that look at lower brainstem function. I should have put a slide in here, but it's called an acoustic reflex threshold. So you're basically playing a sound and you hope that it cycles through the cochlear nucleus, goes to the superior olivary complex, and you hope that it circles back to the inner ear. And the reflex is actually a muscle that contracts that we can measure. So it's kind of like um, if you were to throw a boomerang and you hope that it comes back, this is what that test is like. You put a signal into the ear and you hope that you get a response. And that would indicate that the lower brain stem is working like it should. Now it's interesting also that when we look at these neural fibers, the fibers that cross to the other side, it's actually about 80% of our neural fibers that are going up this auditory pathway cross over to the other side. So information that's being put into the left ear most of that information is making it to the opposite hemisphere. It's going into the right ear. Most of that signal is going to go to the left hemisphere. So going into this a little bit further. So here we have the sound that went into the ear. We go up the auditory pathway. We finally make it to the auditory cortex. So each hemisphere has an auditory cortex, but they're specified to do different types of processing. But specifically in the left hemisphere, we have what's called the Wernicke's area, which is the area that we're processing language with. So at some point we're hearing sound that we need to convert to speech. It needs to be meaningful. And even within Wernicke's area, we have an area called the auditory association area. So that's really where we assume that sounds are being converted into speech. So a pa versus a ba. And this is left hemisphere specific. And this side is also typically looking at very fast paced information. Looking at the right hemisphere, which usually gets ignored because it doesn't have the Wernicke's area, um, it still has processing going on for verbal information. So here's another auditory association area in the right hemisphere. And this is looking more at slower pieces of information. So looking at prosody or you know how the wave of a signal sounds. So if I were to say, um, I'm going to the beach, however, I'm only going to be there for 20 minutes. So the envelope of speech would be where we hear that rise and fall. When I say, however, I'm going to be there for 20 minutes. So this is where it gets a little controversial. Um, anybody in the sciences, um, wants to find something that everyone agrees on. Um, we have research to support it, but in case 
we weren't aware in here, auditory processing is actually something that has been argued about for at least 70 years. And there's a couple different opinions on it um, that I feel like I have to touch on because this is sort of where misunderstandings can come into play. So there is such thing as an auditory processing disorder and there's a language processing disorder. So a language processing disorder would be specific to deficits with our language processing areas of the brain. So here we see the Wernicke's area and Broca's area, which is for speech production as well. Um, and individuals that have language processing disorders have very similar difficulties to someone with an auditory processing disorder. Find it unusually difficult to understand language and organize words and express what someone has said. Both adults and children can be affected. So if a language processing disorder is language specific, an auditory processing disorder should be auditory specific. So in the central auditory nervous system only. But for a lot of the tests that, you know, as myself as an audiologist or a speech language pathologist can also administer some auditory processing tests, they all do rely to some degree on cognitive processes, memory, attention, and we're looking at language. So if I ask somebody to repeat a sentence in background noise, we need our language processing abilities to also come into play for that. So it gets kind of blurry whose area is actually having the difficulty. So just something to think about there. So that kind of leads us to well, what is an auditory processing disorder? So ASHA, which is the speech, uh, the Association of Speech Hearing or America's Speech Hearing Association, um, defines it as a deficit in the neural processing of auditory information in the central auditory nervous system, not related to higher order language or cognition but we kind of see why that's difficult to parse out, but that's their definition. There's currently no standardized test battery that's out there. Um, so you could ask a school, you could ask five different clinics, you could ask a hospital what tests are included in their battery. There's currently, there can be a wide variance in that. There are recommendations based on what processes should be looked at, but not tests. Same thing goes with diagnostic criteria, right? So who has a processing disorder? Some recommendations, there's at least three. You could say somebody has APD if they have a deficit score in one test, but maybe they're, they're massly in that deficit area. You could say that they need to have poor performance on at least two tests um, in your whole test battery. There are also individuals who think that you should have two significant or disordered test results in two or more tests of the same processing ability, which I think is very interesting. If you give three different speech and noise evaluations and they only have difficulty in one, does that really show that they have a difficulty in speech if it's not in the majority of those tests? But somebody else might say, yes, it does demonstrate enough information. So you have a lot of variability there. So things to process and what we want to evaluate. There's a lot of different things on here. So we're gonna actually go through quite a bunch just to look at them a bit closer. Um, but this is really just to show how many different things you could look at in terms of processing ability. The electrophysiological measures is technically the only one that would be auditory only where there's no cognition related or language related information. And that's because with that testing, which we'll look at, somebody does not need to respond in any way. 
So really just one. So let's look at some of these a bit closer. So these are different processes that we would want to assess. So prosodic perception would be the ability to recognize acoustic contours in speech. So we're looking at rhythm, stress, intonation. So kind of like how I said the sentence with however, that would indicate that that word is important, right? So that word and that peak in the sentence would indicate to me that, all right, they gave me a bit of information at the beginning, but it's gonna change somehow, or there's something that we need to alter to that initial statement. Temporal resolution is looking at, is somebody able to look at every bit of information in a speech signal? So it's kind of like, anybody that uses Siri, when Siri listens to us, she's taking samples of our speech and analyzing it. And that's really what humans do. So if somebody has a slower system and they're not getting as many samples as somebody else with a normal system, it's gonna sound unclear or garbled or maybe even like it's all smeared together. Auditory closure. So this is a person, I actually saw someone come in with this like cow mask. It scared me at first, but an auditory closure uh, uh, issue would be when our brain is not able to fill in the gaps of information that we're given. So when we think of these gaps, that can either be done through a fast signal where we don't have every bit of information, or if the signal is distorted in its pitch. So a lot of people have been telling me, well, I'm, I'm not hearing as well because of the masks. And the masks are kind of being like a filter. So when that sound is going through, it's missing some pieces of information. And so if our brain is not able to fill in those gaps, we might not have any idea what that person is saying. Looking at so what some may call selective auditory attention could be referred to as sort of a speech and noise test. If we have a lot of background in a restaurant that's noisy, are we able to selectively attend to what our friend is saying across the table from us? So a couple of these processes seem very similar, but we might test them in different ways. And we'll look at some of the tests as well. Binaural integration it can also be explained as, another word might be dichotic listening. So binaural integration would be where we have two pieces of information in each ear, but they're different and we want to bring them together. So that might be if we're writing notes while someone is speaking to us, you know, you have two different pieces of information and we have to be able to write what someone is saying and we are rehearsing it in our own mind while that person is continuing to speak to us. There's another way to look at um, or interpret binaural integration where we're looking at different modalities entirely. So we could say that someone has an integration deficit if they have a really hard time playing the piano, listening to notes and moving their fingers at the same time, or somebody who struggles to you know, catch a ball or, or walk without stumbling. That person might have a more global integration difficulty with their corpus callosum having their hemispheres communicate. So you might see not just auditory processing issues, but maybe other issues as well. Binaural separation would be, and really the most primary example I see of this is when we're on a phone, if we have two pieces of information and we're trying to ignore one and listen to the one side. So for people that wear hearing aids, they actually can get the benefit of if they have a phone call, if the phone signal goes into both of their hearing aids or into both of their ears, you have less to block out because both of your ears are getting that signal. Um, so that's that binaural separation. And with that, when we have a system that's 
that's disordered, you could certainly have one ear that's much stronger than the other, where we might have a much easier time ignoring information in our left ear, but then not in our right ear. And some individuals will actually say that they feel like competing signals are much louder in one ear, even if they're presented at the same volume. And that just shows that that neural firing on that opposite side is so much stronger that it's perceived to be louder, even if it's not. Uh, sustained auditory attention. You've got people that might argue, is this actually a process, an auditory processing issue or not? But sustained auditory attention would be if you are in a college setting, let's say, or even a setting like this, the longer I'm talking and as you're just continuously processing, is there a point where you start to fatigue? So if you were to continue to listen to me for two hours, at some point, maybe you get bored or it's hard to understand what I'm saying. Um, but for individuals with a true deficit like this, they might get tired after 15 minutes. And so that's where it makes the difference for that person. Oh, I see that Lisa Bailey is, oh, enter the waiting room. <laughs> okay, I don't know if she needs to be admitted. Um, okay, so this is kind of the coolest one, electrophysiologic testing. So this would be a setup, and this is not commonly done, um, but this would be a setup where someone has headphones or insert tips or earbuds, and we would put sticker electrodes on the head, and all you'd have to do is relax. And you would be hearing different stimuli in the ears. And these sticker electrodes are measuring what your brain is doing. So up here at the top, this is about 10 milliseconds of time, which is looking at the, um, the eighth nerve and lower brainstem. And you can go as high as 300 milliseconds. So you really can look all the way up to the auditory cortex and see if somebody has delays in their neural system, which would indicate a processing difficulty. For some reason, their system is not able to assess the signal that was given in a normal time frame. So kind of looking at this in a different way, when we look at these different peaks, they have their own characteristics and we've been able to determine what peaks are associated with what parts of the brain. There are, there is research that's starting to show that we really can use this kind of testing as a way to determine if someone has a processing ability. Um, one of the ways it's called a complex ABR, where you're using speech stimuli to look at how someone's system processes that. And um, there's a researcher out there, she's looking at kids as young as like two months old or within a year old looking to see if they might be at risk of a processing difficulty. All right, just a couple more processes here. So, you know, again, are these auditory? Not really, but they're things that we still look at in the whole picture of processing. Um, so is somebody able to sequence certain words or numbers, directions, um, short-term working memory? Does somebody have the the memory capacity um, to be able to process it, hold it in their mind and provide an answer or repeat what was said to them. Lexical decoding speed is a term used um, greatly for APD where we wanna see if we give different words, are we finding that link between what we're hearing and what we already know in our lexicon? So are we able to hear a word milkshake and how long does it take us to connect that to our lexicon and our language processing. I think of a milkshake, I see it in my mind, I know what it is, and then I can use that information to respond to a question or, you know, continue to talk about that. Direct attention. Um, this can be used in a couple different ways. So if we look at these two hands here and I said, you know, tell me what's in each hand, but tell me the one in the right hand first. So we will use that for auditory processing. If we have different pieces of information in each ear, 
with an attentional component on one side or the other. Again, sort of auditory, you know, uh, language as well. Um, I look at phonological skills. So looking at individual speech sounds, is somebody able to differentiate between them? Can you put them together? Um, which is associated with how we read and write. We're, we're just taking random words and putting them to letters and that's what language is. Uh, and then that leads to sound symbol association. So, you know, even if we take letters out of it, can somebody hear different speech sounds and put them, connect them with different colors maybe? And then I want to see how somebody can manipulate those, which is also what reading and writing is. Uh, I don't think I have time to play this clip, but if anybody ever wants to look up this girl, <laughs> her mother is asking her to say table. And she can say tay, and she can say bull. And her mother says, okay, put it together and say table. And what comes out is pudda pudda. <laughs> So she's probably about, she probably doesn't even look too, but you can kind of see that that's not such an easy task. We think it is, but so much has to come together, table, table. So if she's saying pada pada, she's either being silly or she's having issues coordinating her lips and her tongue, putting them in the right order to say table. Okay, so looking at some different um, auditory processing models. So I won't really get into these too much, but there's three main models. There's the Buffalo model, um, a model created by um, these two researchers, Bellis and Fair. And then we have a spoken language processing model um, by uh, Larry Midwetsky. So this model, it seems like it's really started to become the primary model that's being adopted by clinics and schools. Um, and what this model does is it basically has three main profiles. And depending on your scores and what your test battery looks like, you're either primarily going to have a decoding, prosodic, or integration deficit. You could have a mix of both. But the goal of putting someone in a particular group is that we would then coordinate that with remediation strategies, um, you know, different environmental modifications that that specific group might need. There's also two secondary profiles um, that, you know, these researchers don't seem to think are very closely related to auditory processing. This one, inability to use language rules. So that's kind of saying maybe it's more of a language processing issue. The secondary is a, um, also an output organization. So not really auditory, maybe we see organization issues globally. The spoken language processing model um, is the one that, you know, it looks at so many different things. And Dr. Midwetsky's goal was really just to see how does somebody process language? And there's not so much of a concern on, is it auditory? Is it language? Is it cognition? He was really just looking at this, a person as a whole and wanted to see what are the difficulties? What are our strengths? And using that information to come up with an intervention plan for someone. And so, you know, if you ask me personally, what does my test battery look like? I have about 13 tests <laughs> that I use. And I mine is pretty much a hybrid of the spoken language model and the Bellis and Fair model. Um, because I do want to know how does somebody process very specific auditory processes and how do they process language? Because I want to create remediation strategies to help everything that we've got going on. That's the whole goal. And I should say that the Buffalo model really is what started these two other models. So the Buffalo model is really the, the first one that came up with decoding, integration. Um, there's an organization or sequencing as well. 
And then there's also a tolerance fading memory. So things that are included in the spoken language processing model. So some of these tests um, that we can look at quickly, this would be a test of speech and noise um, or auditory figure ground where there's a figure or a word that is um, enveloped in background noise of some type. So this might just be repeat the words in quiet and then repeat them again with a presentation of noise. And sometimes we use static noise. It might be speech babble, like people talking. And then you can look at the noise in relation to that speech target. So if you wanted to make it more difficult, you're going to increase the noise that's competing with the speech. A filtered words test is looking at that auditory closure ability. If we take these frequencies out of these words and it sounds muffled, is somebody able to use their own knowledge of what that word might be and fill in the gap? So that might look like this test here. Time compressed sentences. So something similar, but instead of taking out pitches, you're taking out pieces of time. So it does sound like rapid speech. Um, you can do this with sentences or you can do this with single words and see how somebody does. The competing sentences test is basically what that sounds like. You have two different sentences in each ear. Um, in some conditions, you might want the person to repeat both items. You know, are they able to understand both? Um, you might want them to ignore one side or the other and see if there's a stronger ear. So actually with this person, you can see that their right ear, they got 88%. On the left ear, they got 48%. So to me, that's saying that when there's a sentence in their right ear, they're really having a hard time blocking that out compared to the opposite side. I think this is my last, yeah. So this last test that we'll look at um, is called the pitch pattern sequence test. So this is looking at a couple different things. It's looking at, can somebody order and sequence a pattern of pitches? So if you heard beep, beep, boop, can you tell that there's two different pitches? Can you tell that there's a pattern and, and sequence them correctly and repeat it? And you can have the person hum it back to you, or you can have more of an integration condition where that person repeats those words with, or compete, repeats the sounds with a word. So if they hear beep, beep, boop, I would want them to say high, high, low to see if they can bring auditory and language information together. Okay, so I know that we're almost out of time. So I'm just gonna go through these kind of quickly um, just for recommendations um, and management. So the first thing that you could look at, depending on the person and what their profile looks like, is what are their surroundings? If there's difficulty in background noise, can you reduce or be away from background noise? Preferential seating doesn't always mean the front. Some professors or lecturers may sit in the back. So your preferred seat would actually be in the back. Um, reducing uh, reverberance, so sitting in places that have curtains, um, and carpet rather than tile and vaulted ceilings. That can also help people with hearing aids too, just affect that, that how much it's, there's reverberation. Um, some individuals may benefit from assistive technology. So, you know, this is very common in a student setting where a teacher or professor is wearing a microphone and then it's transferred directly into a student's ears that can help make that signal more primary, especially if that person's at a distance or there's competing background noise. I always think of a kindergarten classroom. That's probably the most chaotic classroom that there might be. And then thinking of more targeted remediation, depending on what somebody's processing issues are, that's really exactly what you would wanna work on. If somebody has a, an auditory closure deficit, you might have activities that look at a sentence with missing words. What word should go in there? Rhyming words. If we didn't catch a word, but it sounded like mitt, 
what else could it be that fits into that sentence context? You also could do speech and noise training. So increasing that signal as, as you get better at that processing ability. If you have difficulty listening in both ears, that's something that you would wanna train for. Uh, same thing with temporal patterning. If somebody has difficulty differentiating between pitches or somebody has a, process, a prosody issue where to them speech might sound very monotone, you would want to look at stress and intonation kind of like these sentences below and have that person try to vocalize it. If you said it is my house or it is my house, you would want that person to practice, oh, I hear, I'm starting to hear how those are different. There's also a lot of games that can be coordinated with these different processing issues to make it a little more fun. Oh, and that's it. <laughs> okay, so I feel like I threw so much information at everybody, um, but I hope it was generally clear as we went through. Um, but, you know, I think my main takeaway with auditory processing is that, you know, if somebody comes in to see me with difficulties of, you know, I can hear things around me and I have normal hearing, but I'm just not getting it like I should. My goal is to figure out what are our strengths, what are our weaknesses, and then how can we formulate a plan to, to help somebody improve their skills or change the way that their life might look to help them in those situations. Okay. <laughs> so let's see. I see a bunch of things in the chat here. Sheila, can you stop sharing screen? Yes, I can. Okay. All right, so I can't tell is someone I can't tell if someone else is talking. Um, but I'm going to go through some of these questions that are in the chat if that's okay. Um, let's see. Okay, question. Do transducer based phone phone phones work directly with the brain or do they go through normal ear channels? Transfer, transducer based bone phones. Oh, that's a cool question. Okay, so when I think of a bone phone. I hope I'm understanding your question. I think of the signal is, is being pressed on our, it's usually like our mastoid or some part of our head on the bone. And when we use that kind of signal, it's using vibration and it vibrates our bones. And that still starts in the peripheral system. So that vibration, instead of going through the ear canal, then the eardrum, so the eardrum doesn't need to vibrate, but those vibrations are actually vibrating fluid in the inner ear. So it's the same process, that fluid moves, and then these hair cells wiggle, and then the sound goes from the cochlea to the auditory nerve. So it starts that same process. Yep, that's a good question. Okay, let's see. All right, people are having technical issues. <laughs> um, top right, oh, question. Can auditory processing disorders look like dementia? Can they be differentially diagnosed or parsed out? Since studies have shown that hearing loss is positively correlated with dementia, is it possible to separate the two? Okay, so a lot of stuff with like our eyes and our ears, it's not usually good news. So when we look at people's processing disorders, and let's, let's say we're looking at auditory specific information, we actually start to, to see a decline in auditory processing at about 45 years old, a decline. So I will even have people that come in and it's usually that 45, maybe 40 range where they'll tell me I have teenage or adult children and they keep telling me that I can't hear them and that I need hearing aids. 
so I'm here for a hearing test. But we find out that their hearing is perfectly normal. So with normal hearing, that would really lead me to believe that that person is starting to experience more of a processing difficulty. And so that's something that's really more acquired and it's, it's normal that let's say we drop that person in a noisy environment, they might not be able to selectively attend to someone talking to them if there's grandkids and commotion going on. Um, but back to the question, can APD look like dementia? I suppose certain aspects of it, but at least, but with dementia, you can actually take a, a scan, you know, to look at and, and, and diagnose, is this person's brain physically changing? And we're seeing global difficulties overall. So I think you can parse out the two. It would be more with the imaging though, rather than behavioral testing, like, like with APD. So let's so this question says, um, how do you diagnose babies? So this, I, I really don't think anyone is doing this currently, but Nina Kraus is a researcher who's working on the complex AVR with looking at infants. Um, so she's looking to see She's looking at, it's always about latency and amplitude for the most part. So if we give a signal like um, using a B, ba, 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 and then you change it to a P, ba, 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 pa, ba, 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 pa. When you look at that signal, we would want to see in those neural waves, does it change from a pa to a ba? is there a demonstration in that neural activity that we see that the brain recognized a pa versus a ba sound? So this has been in the works for quite some time, but we really don't use these electrophysiological measures to identify auditory processing because it's a heterogeneous disorder so many people can have different looking deficits that you really do want to look at what are your specific issues? How do we address that? And if we do these, these we, if we look at these brainwave measures, it doesn't really correlate yet with what we might expect somebody to struggle with. So if we do a test that says, oh, there's something going on that delays after the inferior colliculus we would expect this person to have X, Y, and Z issues. We don't see that yet. So even though it can give us an additional piece of information on how their system works, it's still not really gonna tell us what intervention that person might need or what they might experience on the day-to-day. -day. Let's see, if I have a peripheral hearing loss, does that automatically mean that I have a central auditory processing challenges? So yes, it does. So although they're still technically different, if we think about what a hearing loss is, it's our physical structures of our ear basically preventing sound to continue its path, right? So if I were to make some of my tests louder, you can technically hear them, but to a certain degree, they're gonna be either distorted or you're still not getting the information the same way as somebody with a normal auditory system. So if someone has a hearing loss and they really wanted to be tested for APD, you would have to parse out, and I would parse out, what tests are affected by hearing loss and what tests are not affected. So if I was gonna do a test about the filtered words where I'm taking frequency information out, if someone has a hearing loss, that test would not be fair, even if it's made louder, because then you have areas of the ear that are hearing it too much. Maybe we're still not getting all the frequency information. It's just not gonna be the same in terms of how you interpret it. 
But if you were going to do language, more language-based processing at a volume that you can hear all of those speech sounds, then that might be more doable. And there are some tests out there that have normative data for people with hearing loss, but there's usually a cutoff. So you would need to have, it's pretty minimal before there are no norms for that. Okay, next question. What are some day-to-day -day symptoms of possible auditory processing problems? So, and as I explain these, this is why there's so much blending of, well, is it a hearing loss? Is it cognition? Somebody with APD might give you a blank stare if you ask them a question. They might have misunderstood the question and they give you the wrong answer. So if you said, oh, are we going to lunch on Thursday? They might say, yeah, Friday is good <laughs> because maybe they heard most of it, but not the last part. Or in a very noisy setting, right? A speech and noise difficulty, processing what someone is saying, misunderstanding that. Um, if someone has a decoding deficit, I would expect them to take a, a while to be thinking about your sentence. And then it might also take them a while to come up with their answer and, and tell it to you. So kind of that blank stare. There are people, it's uncommon if they are identified with a temporal gap or temporal resolution issue where they're not getting every single millisecond of speech, you need to speak to them very slowly so that when it's long and extended, they're able to get chunks of a kind of a bigger signal and that's gonna help them more. If you give them a really fast sentence, they're not gonna get as many, they're not gonna get as much of it. And that, and all of those same things sound like someone with a hearing loss or somebody with a, a cognitive issue, right? Just staring at you, giving the wrong piece of information and so that's when we decide, you know, with a hearing test, okay, if it's hearing loss, that's what we address. If it's not hearing loss, you continue to look at what our difficulties are and you either do like brain activities is basically what you're doing. You're trying to strengthen the, that neural firing um, for better and faster processing. But a true processing disorder is going to plateau at some point. You might see some improvement re with remediation, but that person's still going to struggle. And that's when you bring in um, assistive technology or changing your environment. Okay, last question. Um, does being left-handed or right-handed affect hearing processing? So I would have to look at, there are definitely individuals who look at handedness when they, um, when they look at someone's processing scores. And I would have to see what percentage of humans are right-handed and left-handed, but 98, about 98% of people have dominance of language processing in their left hemisphere auditory processing in their right hemisphere. So with that said, you know, you could look at handedness, but we're still expecting to see left hemisphere dominance. And in adulthood, we're expecting our ears to perform about the same. Um, you know, if we were to look at one ear and then the other ear isolated, but if somebody continues into their adulthood, which is kind of around 12 years old for our auditory system, and there's a, a discrepancy between our ears, that's a pretty large red flag for an auditory processing disorder, whether it's the right ear is better or the left ear is better. That's a good question. Okay, just before one o'clock, <laughs> that was the last question. Okay, I think we are, I don't, I'm supposed to take questions, but I think we've just about run out of time. There's one minute left. Oh my goodness, you gave us an enormous amount of information to process <laughs> and we'll have to do a good job of thinking about that. Um, 
if I may just quickly, before Art closes the meeting, there were enough people who raised their hand at the uh, at a previous meeting about who in our chapter or any of those would be interested in attending a summer gathering. And enough people raised their hands so that we are um, going to begin having a summer gathering on Sunday, August 1st, from two o'clock until four o'clock. And because all of the parks we called were all totally booked up from June, July, August, and September, we're actually going to have the get together here at our house, which is 16 Buckthorn Run. You will all be receiving um, an email about this. We'll be sending out an email blast but anyway, please put it on your calendar if it's something that you would enjoy doing. Two to four, August 1st. And, um, and we thought maybe it'd be fun to have like a wine and cheese plus hors d'oeuvres plus goodie plus desserts. So right, Art, am I remembering what we discussed? I think you adequately? got it. Yeah, I think you've got it all. Okay, so if your name begins with, your last name begins with the letters A through M, how will it be if you bring just a tiny, small, little hors d'oeuvre? And if your um, last name begins with N through Z, a tiny little dessert, because we thought it would be fun to have finger food dessert and finger food um, hors d'oeuvres or a snack. So, okay, Art, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, this will be a very, um, uh, this is more of a get together socialization event, very informal. And um, I, I'm going to try to keep it where we don't have any speeches at all. So everybody should have a good time. So um, this is the last presentation session until we hit the fall series. Uh, re please remember to um, fill out the ev evaluation form for Carol Bradshaw. And uh, we'll be planning the stuff for next year as, as mid-month this month. Uh, also, uh, just keep in mind that uh, the new tagline we have is uh, better hearing equals better living. And uh, <clears throat> so we want to keep using that. So we'll be working through the summer. We're working on some new brochures that accommodate both Zooming and in-person and uh, whatever uh, you can attend or whatever is most comfortable for you. We certainly want to keep people from more distance coming onto these sessions. And uh, also remember that uh, later this month, uh, on June 8th, there's a hope session at 10 o'clock in the morning. And then on the 17th, there's a uh, demo center session. And uh, by the way, the virtual general center has then improve, Lauren's improve the access to it. So um, tap into that sometime. You can get at it by going to the website and looking for VDC. But also join the guys uh, on the 17th because they always talk about new technology. So, uh, and enjoy the summer. I mean, uh, you know, we have just a couple of good months of weather and uh, we got to take advantage of it. Take care and thanks all for coming this morning. Tila, you did a great job. Mm -hmm. There will be a pop quiz a little later in the afternoon, but I don't know how to access it. So uh, you're safe. Take care. Okay. Thanks, Tila. You were great. Thank you for having you me. Wonderful. And you're please come to our summer gathering if you're available. Okay, we'd love to have you. <laughs> yeah, I will talk to Sue about it. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Bye, everybody.